Welcome everyone. Uh, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, which is titled Declining Biodiversity, International Response and Views on the COP15, the Conference of the Parties on Biodiversity. This is the first part of a series of Green Post-Corona Talks on the Biodiversity Crisis. So welcome. My name is Mira van der Meulen. I am a staff member at Oikos Think Tank and I will be moderating tonight's panel conversation. So recently the first phase of the COP15 on biodiversity took place and however despite the urgency and the importance of the current biodiversity crisis there has not been much coverage in the media nor has there, there been much public debate so this is why we are hosting this event uh, to foster more public debate around biodiversity so this series includes uh, four webinars which each highlight a different aspect on the biodiversity crisis as well as proposing different solutions. So the topics go from the current state of play, the COP15 and EU policies, uh, to indigenous movements and the connection between biodiversity loss, climate change and the COVID-19 crisis. And today we uh, announced the first webinar where we will expand on the current state of play. How bad is our biodiversity worsening? How is the international community responding? So this series of Green Post-Corona Talks is um, organized by the Green European Foundation in cooperation with Oikos Think Tank. So the Green European Foundation is a political foundation funded by the European Parliament, aiming to foster greater involvement by citizens in European politics. The Green European Fund Foundation works to create a common green vision for Europe. So with Oikos Think Tank, we work together with the Green European Foundation and we work for social and ecological change by contributing to the public debate. Always from an ecological perspective, focusing on the environmental limitations of our planet and on worldwide solidarity. So just for your information, uh, tonight's webinar will be recorded and published in our, on our YouTube and Facebook channels. And if you have any questions during the presentations, you can ask them in the Q&A fun function. You can find it. Uh, below the videos um, and you can ask your questions there and we can come back to them to the Q&A round. If you see that anyone else has already posed a question, you can vote these questions up so that we can see that, uh, that several people have the same question. So then uh, I am very happy to announce tonight's speakers, which are all three uh, experts in the field of biodiversity. So first we have with us Ignaz Schops, who is uh, the director of the Belgian NGO Regional Landschap, Kempen and Maasland. He is the former president of the Europark Federation, the largest network on natural heritage in Europe. Ignaz is also a member of the EU chapter on the Club of Rome and a member of the Rewilding Europe Circle. He was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2008, which is also known as the Green Nobel Prize. He has since been awarded several times for his work. So Ignaz, he will give us an overview of the current situation. How bad is it? At what rates are we losing biodiversity? Why does it matter to us? And what are possible ways forward? So secondly, we have with us Hilde Eierbond, who is trained as a freshwater biologist. She is the strategic coordinator of the Belgian Biodiversity Platform, which is a nat national science policy interface for biodiversity. Hilde is also chair and coordinator for Biodiversity Plus, bringing together research programmers and environmental policy actors, building the bridge between science, policy and practice as part of the European Biodiversity Strategy 2030. She also acts as Belgian focal point for the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPBES. Her presentation will focus on the role of the IPBES. Um, yeah, the role of the IPBS in providing a solid knowledge base to the policy negotiations. And then thirdly, we have with us Basil from Havre, uh, Van Havre, all the way from Canada. And he is a co-chair for the UN Convention on Biolog Biological Diversity's uh, open-ended working group for a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. He has over 27 years of experience working for Canada's Environment Department, where he also worked as a Director General of Biodiversity and Partnerships and as Director of Population Conservation and Management at the Canadian Wildlife Service. He was also Chair of the SITES Elephant Working Group and of discussions on Indigenous knowledge and repatriation. So he also plays an important role in today's COP15 negotiations 
and he will give us an update on the post 22 global biodiversity framework. So, of course, we are very happy to present you this panel. So thank you for the speakers uh, for being here with us. And uh, thank you also for the audience. Um, so first, each of the speakers will present for 15 minutes. And after that, we will take a, a two minute break and then come back for the Q&A round. So without further ado, I am very happy to give the word to uh, Ignaz Schops. Thank you, Mira, for introducing me and welcome everybody to this uh interesting, I think, workshop or webinar to today about the COP15 and the biodiversity strategy. I'm going to uh, share my screen um, with you so I can do my 15 minutes talk um, and share with you if now somebody, Mira, if you can say if it is for you, okay, this is also in. Um, yes, we can still see the. It's not, is it now not? Okay, it's not I, on presentation mode. It should be now. Mm, now we can still see the the panel on the left with all the images. Oh, for, me, for me, it's all right. Oh, okay. Okay, so I will try to do it again. Share screen. So yeah, welcome. So I'm going to talk about biodiversity, of course, uh, and uh, talk about. Let's see when it's working now. Hmm. It is still the same. We can still see the the screen, but maybe it's not a big problem. Uh, yeah, but let's see. Normally, it must be for me. It's now okay, but not for you, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it's uh, for someone else. It is also okay. So perhaps you can. Uh, yeah. I okay. Think. It's okay. I think. Okay. So very quickly. So. Biodiversity and the conventional biological diversity, and I think Basila van Haver will talk a lot about that. <clears throat> I just say, will, uh, would like to say that there is a Kunming declaration of last year's CBD uh, building on a shared future for all life on Earth, with 17 commitments to really work on a global biodiversity framework. I was in the former uh, conventional biological diversity in Nagoya with the key targets and and uh, so I a little bit know about biodiversity and how it works and also how it relates to governments and to the broader society. So luckily we have the most beautiful places still on earth and that's it's a good news of today. Um, and we see also in my country, because this is the pictures of my country where we have now in Flanders and uh, the first cranes that are breeding and we have the wolf is coming back. So we have good news, uh, which is interesting. And if you look at European level, you see also that the European carnivores are increasing cred incredibly in Europe with 17 brown bears and, and 9,000 uh, Eurasian lynxes. But of course, there is an other, another inconvenient truth, and it is that there is a population drop of all species uh, of 68% since 1970. That's uh, related to the Living Planet Report of WWF, and scientists start to talk about the defaunation of populations. Same story when you look at the red list of uh, species of IUCN, where you see that there is also uh, a big, big problem with uh, the extinction of species and the threatening, threatening with extinction. So 40, 41% of a bit amphibian, yeah. sorry. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but apparently the slides are not moving. I don't know if you are going. Not... Are you still on the first slide? Let's see where it is then. The slides are not moving. Now we went to slide eight. Is it in presentation mode? Because for me, it's everything OK. I have to do this. Yeah, I think we just saw the first slide, and now we see slide eight. So I and think does it now go to slide nine? No. No. That's... Apparently, it is not in a presentation mode. It is unbelievable for me. It's completely OK. What is wrong then? And now we see slide nine. I think it might be I, the internet. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe internet. So I do it like this. Huh? Yeah. So you see here, one million species are in danger of extinction. And as also Jane Goodall was saying that whatever you look, and also maybe Hilda will focus on that with IP Bass, 
Yeah, so 1 million species are at risk of extinction, 40% of amphibians, 25% uh, of mammals, you can see it for yourself. It's not going, going to the, the right direction. And of course, a lot of strategies and biodiversity strategies are uh, um, uh, presented. The biodiversity strategy 2010 and also 2020 by the EU. And you see again, the EU is missing the 2020 biodiversity star, uh, targets by a long shot, according to the European Environment Agency. So we see that whatever we try to do, there is a huge problem with, with uh, biodiversity, with the conservation goals, where you see on this slide, where we are not in line with all, let's say, the object, objectives that we want to achieve. So the question will be how to deal with that. And, and we see it in every country, also in my country. And if you go to my country and my uh, area in, in Belgium where I live in Flanders, you see again also 28% is severely endangered or vulnerable and 7% are lost, uh, uh, species are lost in the last 100 years. This is a picture of an albatross who was trying to pick up some food in the sea, but then he misses because he thinks that plastics and microplastic, the plastic soup, everybody knows, of course, that, uh, that is his food and then his stomach explodes, which is not the right way to do so. And also fishes are accumulating uh, microplastics in their body. And of course, people and human beings eat uh, are eating fishes. So they have problems as well. So we have huge problems where we really are logging the lungs out of our planet. The question is then, do we really uh, are aware that we are not only cutting the trees, but also the species that are living around and on it. And if you compare that to climate change, of course, where we see a similar situation where, yeah, we are not in line with the objectives of uh, Paris in 2015, but we are more in line going to 4.3 degrees Celsius. And if you look at another graph, another presentation of it, you see yourself and me, I uh, was born in 1964, you see my children, my grandchildren just in such a small period of time can really grow into huge, huge, huge problems. And if you look and compare that to species, you see a similar situation, of course, because if you can fly or can run, you can easily go to habitats, to nature, to, to, to ecosystems, which are in line with your needs. Often they are colder. But of course, the, the less mobile you are, the less possi uh, possibilities you have, and you then you go extinct. So also there you see a big and a huge problem. Huh? If we look to the, the amount of wilderness globally, you see in 1937, we already, we still had 66% of wilderness globally, but now in 2020, we are yeah, more or less at 35% of wilderness. So the deeper, the deeper we go into by wilderness, the more problems we uh, occur. And then you see, of course, uh, COVID. Huh? And if you think that COVID as a virus uh, comes with, uh, comes alone, well, you cannot see that. But if you think that COVID goes, comes alone, uh, no, all these other viruses like West Nile virus, Ch uh, Chikas disease, Dengue, Chikungunya, Zika are really spreading the world through, uh, due to uh, global warming. In this slide, you see that, that since the 1960s of former century, you see again an increase of zones, um, so of, of uh, viruses that now spill over to human beings. Being. So we have to watch out and be aware that biodiversity is more than the birds and the bees. Huh? Also the food production, the, uh, the microorganisms in the soil that what, what we cannot see are decreasing at a rate 10,000 times faster than ever before. Huh? Just um, calculation of the value of, of cultivated crops by the fertilization of bees was estimated at 153 billion euros a year in 2008. Huh? Same story about our health. Huh? Also, we have billions and billions of microorganisms in and on our body. And also these kind of healthy ecosystems are decreasing rapidly. So we can easily um, learn out ourselves how the planet reacts. So if we, have, if we are raising one uh, degree temperature, then we feel sick. Uh, but if the world is, uh, is, is, is warming for one degree, we are not that easily uh, committed to do something. And of course, we are now in a planetary, planetary emergency where all the planetary boundaries are 
yeah, three, four, maybe five of them are now trespassed. So what we see now is that we are really in a very challenging position and we are losing our comfort zone. And we see at several levels, also in the economic sector, you see that there are still subsidies that are given to, 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 to a lot of activities that are very harmful for biodiversity. So how to deal with that? So it's a time to change. So you could make a timeline of biodiversity loss and climate change where we th firstly thought that it wasn't real. Then we thought that we are not uh, you, you, uh, causing these problems. And now in a short period of times, we come to senses and we say, well, fuck, what is going on? We need to move rapidly. So we have to make the earth great again. And you know, I was lucky to, to talk several times with, with uh, Edward O. Wilson, who said the most dangerous world view is the world view of those who have not viewed the world. And he, he is really decisive in his fantastic book and that we need to protect half the earth uh, to, to try to protect 80% of the species. So we have to mind the gap. What are the connections we need to make in the, make in the future? And that's why the sustainable development goals are so important. And here you see the transition already to the people planet profit. So it's the, the triangle of, of sustainability that it will change where the biosphere becomes more important in the future. And luckily we make good agreements and we're trying to make good agreements, but we were very, we, it was a failure again in Glasgow and also now with Kunming, we have to try to really take the right passes, the right, the right steps before, before forward because biodiversity and climate change are two sides of the same coin we have to bring all our brains into the game and try to get biodiversity, nature positive by 2030 and how to do so. So we need to think in systems. We, have, we need to be, become system thinkers where we not uh, think about linear economy, but about circular economy, where we have to think, not to think in parts, but in holes, not in silence, but we have, we have to really collaboratively work together so COVID is, if you look at it, it's not a disease, but a symptom of an exhausted planet. And maybe is the restoration of natural ecosystems the best vaccine we can have. I'm nearly at the end. Um, so what we see in the future, of course, is that uh, the big goal of, of, uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity is trying to have that protection of 30% on land and uh, in the seas. Let's hope that will come. Uh, but the, the, the EU biodiversity strategy already decided to go for the 30% goal and made a new biodiversity strategy for 2030. And the good thing was that also Ursula von der Leyen was really uh, making a, a plea for, for uh, a new kind of Paris-like agreement for biodiversity at the World Economic Fa uh, uh, Forum in, in Davos two months ago. And economically, we see also new uh, systems are raising, uh, and that's with Kate Raworth, but also Marina Matsukato is a very interesting uh, economist to follow. We need to go from a moonshot where F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy said, we want to have a man on the moon in the next decade, and that he succeeded in 10 years. We need now need to go to an earth shot, an earth shot to really make our work in the next decade, and maybe the CBD and the, the COP15 can help us with that. And maybe we have to question ourselves, if we have the blue helmets to, for peace protection, why don't we have the, the, the green helmets uh, for biodiversity protection? Maybe that's a goal to do so. We have to think global. Huh? So, so as global, it means try to find local solutions for global challenges where a good translation is so important. And that's why we and myself and my team designed the reconnection model, which tries to reconnect biodiversity, nature, with the local society, because we know that it brings a lot of value, also social economic benefits, besides the intrinsic values, besides biodiversity, besides uh, natural ecosystems uh, protection. And what we see, of course, that is a lot of money is going on in the biodiversity world. Uh, re research done by the Cambridge University in 2015, you see that 8 billion visits every year to protected areas, bringing $600 billion into the game interesting to talk and to translate we see that one euro invested in national parks brings 10 euros to the local uh, community let's not destroy what keeps us alive that's a beautiful message and a strong message because we have to keep in mind that nature biodiversity natural ecosystems are our sponge they keep us feet dry they're the fridge 
they forecome uh, global warming and they're the health center. So the last light of me, of me is save the planet to save ourselves and to think globally, act locally and change personally. Sorry for not having the presentation mode, but that was my presentation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ignaz. That was a great presentation, even if it was not uh, in presentation mode. Um, I think we all saw and got the message, so thank you. So um, then I give the word to uh, Hilde Egermund. Thank you. Can you see my presentation in <laughs> presentation mode? Yes, it is okay. in presentation mode. <laughs> Okay, cool. So uh, indeed, I will elaborate a bit on uh, DIPES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and, and more specifically also the role that it has in providing a, a solid knowledge base for the policy negotiations. Um, maybe first explaining briefly what DIPES is. Um, so it's a, an, what we call a science policy interface, um, and it's summarizing existing knowledge on biodiversity issues and providing options to policymakers um, to adjust their course of action. So it's not doing new research, but it provides uh, the policymakers with a solid uh, knowledge base. Um, and we've seen in the context of the climate change discussions how important it is, how important science can be to move to more, cl uh, more climate friendly uh, policies and practices. And so the hope is that YIPES can be a similar scientific authority when it comes to nature conservation. It's much younger than the IPCC. It's, um, it was only established in 2012, whereas the IPCC was established in uh, 1988. Um, but um, so far, it has already produced uh, significant uh, deliverables. It has several key functions. Uh, the most uh, famous one, I would say, is the assessment function. Uh, so it uh, synthesizes and critically evaluates um, available knowledge and um, so that it does it on a thematic uh, topics, but also there are some methodological assessment, regional assessments and global assessment. And then it also has other uh, functions, um, including, for example, also capacity building. And that is also um, something that is uh, making it different from, for example, the IPCC that does not have this type of um, function. Um, what is also important for the for the IPIS is that it's uh, it aims to be a scientifically uh, independent body, so it means that all the assessments and all the products that come from DIPES, they go through a peer-reviewed process. And this peer review process also includes um, review by governments um, itself. And so also the, the decision-making process is very transparent, so that also adds to the um, credibility, the relevance, and the legitimacy of the outcomes of DIPES. It also looks not only at peer-reviewed literature, but it also includes um, indigenous and local knowledge. Uh, it focuses on interdisciplinary uh, approaches, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and it also aims to avoid application with um, other um, existing initiatives, but rather um, uh, increase synergies. And most importantly, it responds to requests from uh, multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Convention for Biological Diversity, but also it responds to requests from individual governments and it can also um, respond to requests from, um, from, uh, from civil society. And so over the last uh, 10 years, there have been several assessments that have been produced, and I will just highlight a few. Um, the, the first ones that were produced was uh, the pollinator assessment. That was actually a, what we call a thematic assessment, um, assessing the role um, of native and um, exotic pollinators, and also looking at the status and trends of pollinators and also what the impacts are of decline on um, human well-being and on food production and of course also uh, pointing to policy options to bring pollinators back into the landscape and this was quite important also in the context of the convention on biological diversity because um, the, the um, outcomes were endorsed by the governments at that level, and that resulted, for example, also in the setup of the Coalition of the Willing, uh, which is a growing number of governments that is currently um, inspired by the assessment and um, um, acting at the national level, implementing strategies and action plans um, on pollination. So the EPIS assessments, once they are taken up and endorsed by uh, at the level of the CBD, then they also really have an impact um, on the ground. And other assessments um, that you may have heard of is, for example, the land degradation assessment that was launched in 2018. 
that was not only important in the context of the CBD, but also in the context of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Uh, so these are assessments that are already published. Um, there are also a few assessments that are currently ongoing. Um, and for example, uh, the assessment on the sustainable use of wild species will be released um, in July um, this year. So this is something to uh, look, for, look forward to. And then there are also other types of assessment, uh, which what we call the methodological assessments. They may be a bit less straightforward or, or easy to understand, but they are extremely important also in the policy context. And the first of this kind um, that was uh, launched by DIPES was the methodological assessment on scenarios and models for biodiversity. And you can consider this as a, a best practice um, uh, toolkit for the use of scenarios and models um, in decision making on biodiversity. And why is this important? Because um, these, uh, this assessment basically explains uh, the, the value of scenarios and models to predict um, plausible outcomes um, of a certain policy, of a certain action. Um, and also it can give a better understanding of the different options of the different paths that you could follow to reach a certain objective. So it's really very important um, in the context of decision making. And it was, for example, also a key piece that was used um, in the context of uh, the fifth global biodiversity outlook. Um, and also maybe uh, nice to know is that um, also this year, um, another methodological assessment will be launched at the EPIS uh, plenary in July, which is uh, an assessment on the values of biodiversity. And there's also uh, an assessment planned that will look at the impacts and the dependencies of the private sector on biodiversity. And of course, these type of assessments can also help to mainstream biodiversity. And I'm sure that my colleague will uh, come back to that um, in the context of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So these methodological assessments are also a key piece for uh, the policy negotiations. Um, other um, important assessments that have been released um, in 2018 were the four regional assessments. Um, so there was an assessment on uh, biodiversity for Africa, for Europe and Central Asia, for the Americas and for Asia and the Pacific. And in each of these assessments, uh, we looked at similar questions. Um, for example, what is the status of biodiversity? What are the drivers of biodiversity loss? Um, what are the actual and potential impacts of various policies and interventions? And what are the gaps in the knowledge? So uh, to give you maybe an idea of the size of these assessments, um, for example, the European and Central Asia assessment, it was conducted by over 120 leading international experts coming from 36 countries. They worked on this assessment for over three years. Uh, they reviewed more than 4,000 uh, publications, not only peer-reviewed publications, but also government reports, indigenous and local knowledge, and other resources. And the drafts that they produced, they were refined by comments from over 7,000. So they from um, over 7,700 comments, comments coming from external reviewers, but also from the governments th themselves. And that is actually very important to know that the governments, they are um, engaged throughout the development of these assessments. And that also means that they um, uh, and endorse these um, uh, recommendations coming out of these reports. And this gives it also much more leverage when it comes to the level of the CBD. Um, it's, it's, it's really not neutral that the governments have been um, engaged in the negotiations at the EPES level. It ensures that ownership over these type of um, recommendations. Um, and then um, uh, I think one of the yeah, key most compelling products of the EPES is the EPES Global Assessment that was released in 2019. Um, and that was, that was indeed also a key piece now for uh, the negotiations uh, in the context of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, it builds on the existing uh, thematic assessments, on the existing uh, regional and sub-regional assessments, and it also builds on the national reports from the signatories of the Convention on Biological Diversity. It answers very similar questions as the ones that were addressed in the regional assessments, but then it takes it up to the global level. Um, and it's really the first of its kind, not only in terms of, uh, again, the size of the work and the number of experts involved, but again, because it was endorsed, the recommendations were endorsed by the governments, which was not the case 
um, for example, in the uh, well-known Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that was uh, launched in 2005. Um, and so this assessment, it looked um, also very specifically into the effectiveness of policies and, and policy responses. Um, but also, for example, um, it looked at the state of play, um, showing that more species of plants and animals are threatened with extinction um, now than in any other time in human history. Um, and so an estimated 1 million uh, species are indeed um, threatened uh, with extinction. That is a key outcome of this global assessment. What also came clearly out of this assessment are the drivers of biodiversity loss at a global scale. So these are land use change, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, and also invasive alien species. And it did not only point to the direct drivers of biodiversity loss, but it also explained the underlying drivers of biodiversity loss. And this relates to the way we value nature, to the way uh, to demographic processes, to the uh, economic paradigm, to technological advances and many more. Um, another key outcome also of the global assessment was um, that uh, it clearly um, showed the significant contribution that indigenous people and local communities have um, on nature conservation, not only in terms of the percentage of uh, protected lands that are, is directly managed by them, but also in terms of uh, the efficiency of, the, of their efforts. Um, what you can see here is a summary of the progress uh, towards the Aichi targets that uh, Ineas was also referring to. So these are the targets um, of the uh, strategic plan uh, from 2011 to 2020. So here you can just see that um, for most of the targets, uh, there was very little progress. For a few targets, there was moderate progress. And for four targets, there was um, good progress. Also, of course, this tells us a lot about uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of policies over the last 10 years. But this also tells us that we lack um, information to properly assess uh, the progress of the targets, that we lack uh, biodiversity monitoring data, that we lack good indicators, and also that we lack proper follow-up of um, the targets. And I'm sure that Basile will also um, come back to that. A bit similar uh, when it comes to the progress of the Sustainable Development Goals, so what you can see here um, is a summary of uh, the recent status uh, and trends and aspects of nature and nature contributions to people um, supporting progress towards achieving the SDGs. Um, and so you may know that biodiversity is directly underpinning achievements of SDGs such as um, clean water, climate action, life below water and life on land, but it's also indirectly playing an important role um, in um, relation to, for example, poverty, in relation to hunger, health, and also sustainable cities. And so again, you can see that little progress um, has been made over the last um, couple of years. Um, what you also have as a major outcome um, from the global assessment is um, that it has done indeed quite a lot of work in terms of looking into the future, um, looking into what uh, is the outcome of, uh, for example, a business as usual scenario, what is the outcome of a scenario where uh, you have rapid economic growth and low regulation, or it also looked at scenarios, for example, where there's a big focus on global sustainability with proactive environmental policies and also sustainable production and consumption. And so for each of the scenarios, it gives you a certain outcome. And it's clear that um, nature and nature contributions to people can only be safeguarded where you have indeed a great focus on sustainability. Um, and then also the last uh, main outcome of the global assessment was um, in terms of um, that we can only um, conserve uh, and restore and sustainably use nature um, while simultaneously meeting all the other um, global challenges through the so-called um, transformative change. Transformative change. It means that we indeed need a very fundamental shift um, in uh, our um, in our um, economic in our economic economic systems, in our governance, in equity, in cross sectoral planning, um, also in social narratives and in our values. And so that is actually a key outcome that is now also um, taken up in the discussions um, on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. The fact that we need to act um, uh, um, across um, over over different sectors and across um, society and make very uh, fundamental changes in uh, the way we value um, nature. 
And so the last thing that I would like to highlight um, is uh, two deliverables or the two most recent deliverables, because I think these can also feed um, into the forthcoming post-corona talks. Um, one is um, the IPES uh, workshop report on biodiversity and pandemics. Um, and this is actually um, the most uh, scientifically robust examination of the evidence about the links between the pandemics uh, risk and nature since uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, began. Um, and it's the outcome of a workshop uh, between world leading experts uh, that is offering again a number of policy options that would help us to reduce and address uh, the pandemic risk. Um, and really looking at a problem in a very holistic manner, uh, not only uh, referring to technolo technological advances and to vaccination programs, but rather pointing to the need of uh, investing in nature-based recovery, investing also in uh, tackling uh, aspects of wildlife trade and many other issues. And then the other report that is also um, very uh, interesting to read is the, is the report uh, focusing on biodiversity and climate change. So it looks at existing reports, the EPS reports and the IPCC reports, and it brings forward some key messages um, on the interlinkages between biodiversity and climate change. And we hope that this can also be the basis of more work between the IPES and the IPCC, and maybe uh, it can also be the basis of a full-fledged assessment fo focusing on uh, the interlinkages between biodiversity and climate change. And then, of course, it will also have an impact on, um, the, on the or feeding into the Convention on Biological Diversity and also um, into the Convention on uh, Climate Change. So I will leave it here, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, have uh, on the IPES process. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Hilda. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so we will pass the word to uh, Basil van Haven. You can share your screen. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody. I will also share my screen and uh, have, use a few slides. And Mia, if you can. Give me the thumbs up if you can see my screen. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. So uh, I have uh, 16 slides, but I, I'll I'll think I'll I'll go rather fast on a, on a few ones and and spend more time on the other. Lots of parallel leakage to the presentation made before by by Ilde and Ignace. So uh, where we are on uh, on the negotiation. Uh, what uh, the context is that we were asked to present a, a realistic yet ambitious framework. Realistic in the sense that it is recognizing how our world is evolving from a socioeconomic and development reality. We're going to be adding half a billion people, mainly in one region in Africa, and, and there is a, a very legitimate uh, requirement from, from that region to have the kind of socioeconomic development that we've been enjoying for, for decades and hundreds of years. It has at the same time to be ambitious, enabling us to reach that vision, that vision of living in harmony with nature. It has to be a comprehensive framework, uh, addressing all drivers of biodiversity loss. You heard, and, and I've, you've seen in the previous slides and presenters, the 30 by 30 uh, on protected area, but you heard also Ignace talking about pollution with those very taking pictures of birds or, or fish. So that's another. So there is no success without addressing all of the, the drivers of biodiversity loss. It has to be a, a framework for all. So it's not just a framework for Ministry of the Environment. It has to be a whole of government and in fact, a whole of society approach. So we have to have business, civil society, everybody engage into that effort. Talking about synergy with the other Rio Convention. So following on the footstep of uh, the IPES and IPCC, uh, we're thinking that we need to move from a local level because most of the project and the activities you're, you, we're contemplating often have more than one objective. If you're doing restoration in a, in a landscape that has been uh, uh, modified by forestry, often you're getting the climate change benefit, but you're also getting a, a species benefit. So moving from that local to a global level, focusing on project planning, reporting, and, and resourcing building on each other, and I'll come back to, to uh, talk about that. Uh, very big help to us coming from the COP26. What can COP15 bring to the UNFCCC in addition to what it does for itself? Learning from the others. And 
and adapting to a new financial context. We're, we're seeing that uh, uh, there is big change and, and what was possible in the uh, in the in 2010 uh, during the HE negotiation is different now, but there is also a huge potential uh, following up. Now moving to the to the process, uh, I'm not expecting everybody to go through the whole thing there, but it is uh, important to realize that we started in in late 2018, and we moved fairly rapidly through a, a relatively significant process in in 2019. But immediately after the second meeting of the Open and Wordic Group, we went into that uh, COVID uh, period, which hopefully will be finishing very soon. But we've been able to do the, the, the best we can. Uh, there is a commitment uh, from all of us to not engage into formal negotiation uh, before we get face to face and for very good reason. But yet we hope to be able to uh, uh, continue and we're confident that we're going to be able to meet face to face in March in Geneva to carry the, the three meeting, the, the, the subsidiary body on science and technology, the subsidiary body on implementation and our third meeting, the second phase of the third meeting of the open and working group. And that would lead to a COP that will be set uh, sometime uh, this summer. So that's, that's where we are in terms of the process. Now, uh, the theory of change or the, 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 the logic model. If you look at the left part with indirect and direct drivers, this is a cut and paste from the, the model from the EPES. So that's what Hilde uh, just showed you uh, a minute ago. What, uh, what we, we've added is the part that is, uh, that is uh, 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 next to that. The current status in terms of ecosystem degradation, uh, losing the service, and jeopardizing well-being. And then if you go to the far right, you see that vision that is not for negotiation. What we're working on is that centerpiece targets, milestones, and goals. And then basically what we're trying to do is to translate that vision that everybody agreed to, which is rather lofty, into measurable goals, measurable goals for 2030, and then stepping those down to 2020 with the milestones. And the targets at the center, you see 21 targets that are grouped in, in three package. First package is around reducing threats and, and you can make very clear links uh, between those and the direct drivers, uh, planning and retaining planning, land use planning, sea use planning and retaining wild area, restoring uh, uh, land and sea and then protect and conserve the famous 30 by 30. Uh, action related to species uh, recovery, uh, ensuring that harvest and trade is sustainable, invasive, addressing invasive alien species, pollution and climate. Let's not forget that there is three objective in the convention. And one, one message we got very clearly, particularly from developing countries is to uh, rebalance the three objective and making sure that there's an adequate consideration uh, of the targets that are uh, supporting meeting people needs. Um, the use of species, traditional uh, harvest of species for human well-being, but also how we use the ecosystems, agriculture, fishery, and, and forestry, and how we ensure that while doing that um, sustainably, we can also meet people these. There is the other contribution, the many, many uh, ways nature is supporting us, uh, how uh, urban space, wild space, and how urban population are benefiting from, from uh, uh, nature, access and benefit sharing. And then all that is supported by a set of tools and solution. Uh, 14, 15, and 16 is around uh, mainstreaming, and, and they're focused on the capacity to act of various groups, 14 mostly on government, 15 on business, and 16 on, on, on the citizen choice and how we behave in, individually. Then the impact of uh, biotech, 18 and 19 are very important, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on those. Then resource um, management, 19, information and engagement. All that within the context of implementation guidance, enabling condition, and the system for increased planning, reporting, and review. We're suggesting a, a, in, in the latest draft to have uh, implementation guidance, which is uh, a way to address some of the aspects that are cross-cutting 
across the the whole uh, framework, and I'll just point to a few one here: uh, human rights and the different value system, including in some society with the notion of uh, Mother Earth, and integration of the three convention, and the need to have adequate resource. I'll go fast over the next few slides because, and I want I will leave them to you, but I wanna I wanna focus on a few concepts at the end. So this is a description of the four goals. We, we realize that the, the first one is very wordy, but it's complex, but you can see it in the, in the three milestone that there is, there is way to, to uh, break it down into some details. But let's look at the, the first block of action target on related to, to land and sea. And, and I think it's important uh, to understand that it's not easy to add up everything. So some people are saying that if you protect 30% uh, and you restore 20%, you are the half hers. And, and, and what should be clear is that there is no one plus one equal two. There is some overlap and that's what the, the graph at the bottom. But what we need is to have this overall increase in functional ecosystem, which is at the current point suggested to be 15% with a, a, a plus 5% point at 2030, but undoubtedly there will be lots of discussion on that. The rest of the targets are, are important equally, and, but I'll, I'll, I'll point to, to some of those. Uh, target seven on the pollution, which is uh, uh, asking for a reduction in the uh, use in the flow of nutrients and, and pesticide. Undoubtedly, that will be uh, the subject of a lot of discussion, both in terms of the value of those targets and what those numbers should be. Number eight is that uh, symbi symbiotic relationship with the climate change, which is both um, a cause of biodiversity uh, loss and where um, uh, the, uh, the nature can be a solution as well. So you get the two sides of it in terms of what can nature contribute? And there is a suggestion that is uh, with a number here in terms of gigaton of uh, CO2 equivalent, but also ensuring that the action taken on the climate side are, uh, are also nature neutral or positive. I've talked about targets 9, 10, 11, so I don't need to go back on them as well as 12 on urban dwellers. I've talked about the, uh, uh, the three targets on mainstreaming as well as the negative impact of biodiversity. Talking about resource, uh, there is, as you can imagine, and everybody knows, there is two sides to the equation is how can we bring costs down? And that's the, the, the focus of target 18. Uh, Ignace has talked about this enormous amount of negative subsidies and, and showed you the, the numbers coming from the OECD. So we got a big push from the climate change COP26 with addressing about half of, the, of the, what we're trying to do under target 18, which is the subsidies on the oil and gas sector. What we left to, to deal with is the agri-food system uh, subsidies. At the bottom of it, there is the other part, which is about how do we increase the resource level from where it is now, and it's proposed to be at the 200 billion level with, uh, within that a, a, a portion dedicated to, um, to uh, overseas development aid that should be increased by 10 billion. So we're quite a way uh, along our way here. Oh, there is a number of other sections, and, and I won't go into, into too much detail. What is important to, to keep in mind is that from the, the vision here, this is a system that works together. It is not a, a menu from which you can choose some targets. Um, all of the targets are contributing to all of the milestone and all the goals. So we need to have kind of a comprehensive and organized agenda to make it work. Um, in term, the image in terms of how we can work together with, with uh, others, uh, we saw that, uh, that huge contribution that climate can make to the biodiversity agenda. Now the question is what contribution can we make on the biodiversity side to the agenda? And, and then uh, looking at it like a, a relay race where we pass the baton from one to the other and we contribute uh, to each other. This is not a competition. 
Uh, both my predecessor has shown the, the EPS contribution. This is just another way to look at it and to show how <coughs> the indirect drivers are addressed through the, uh, um, the system of sustainable development as well and how we're working uh, together on that. So this completes my presentation. I totally lost track of time. So Mira, I hope I have not destroyed your agenda and I'm looking forward to the rest of the agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Basil. No, uh, I think all of you um, had a great timing. So it is now uh, 2022. So um, I just give a short break and then we will go to the questions uh, at 25. So see you in a couple of minutes. Okay, so the three of you are still here, so we can start again once Hilde is back, maybe. Ah, you are here. Okay, great. So I saw that we had some uh, interesting questions already in the Q&A. Um, so I will just follow the, the upvotes. Um, and I will just ask a question. If it is not directed to one specific person, then um, you can choose who it is for, or all three of you might have something to say about it. So the first question is, um, how exactly does the IPBS integrate indigenous knowledge? And especially when the indigenous knowledge is highly critical of Global North conservation projects. Um, so how do you fare with the post-colonial critiques on a biodiversity-based nature protection especially when it comes to how the ambition of nature conservation projects works by fencing off land from local and indigenous communities. So perhaps um, Hilde, uh, could you elaborate on this? Yeah, at least at the, on the first part of the question, maybe the second part can be, can be taken by, by my colleagues. Um, but uh, when it comes to uh, indigenous and local knowledge, um, the IPES has set up what they call a participatory mechanism to integrate this type of knowledge. Um, and so the way they do it is, um, for example, um, specifically um, uh, engaging with indigenous and local knowledge holders through specific events. 
Um, but what they also have is a, is a task force, an indigenous and local knowledge task force. And in that task force, you have experts that are experts on indigenous and local knowledge. So they, they are the ones that bring in this type of, of, of knowledge uh, in addition to the yeah the the more the other types of knowledge that that we know so they have put in place a very specific process to uh, to engage um, with this type of knowledge throughout the different assessments but maybe for the second part i will refer to uh, my uh, colleagues I, i'll yeah, be Dr. happy to uh, to yeah. to share some thoughts on that i think the 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 issue of uh, of the potential negative impact on the indigenous people of all of our activity is, is one that, that is absolutely right to keep in mind. Now, there is uh, the starting point from a solution is recognizing that indigenous people and local community are part of the solution, not the problem. And, and um, the, a number of countries have changed their ways and are in fact, uh, working with indigenous people in terms of finding solution for land conservation. And as part of that, as part uh, created dynamic of reconciliation and better relationship. For example, here in Canada, there is absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind that uh, reaching 25 and 30% will be largely based on the indigenous led conservation initiative. So it is not people from a way setting up uh, protected area indigenous land. It is indigenous people with their own government mechanism doing the protection of their land as part of a national context. So uh, absolutely uh, essential to, to continue to keep an eye out for that. The conditions are very different in many countries and in some, in some places it's difficult. But my, my hope is that protection and conservation can be a tool for reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the first, uh, the second question: um, What is the why is the obvious link between biodiversity loss and human health and pandemics so little covered in the media? Uh, could you give some specific examples of on efficient cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary collaborations, for example, between academics and public bodies? Uh, perhaps um, Ignas. Uh, do you want to uh, talk about this topic? Well, that it is not uh, often in, together in the media. I think it's uh, part of the, let's say, an evolution that we are going through at, at the moment while, where biodiversity and also we, uh, if we focus on biodiversity, we uh, for, for many years, and, and rightly so, I would say, at, at, the, at those years, we were focusing on the bird and the bees on our core business of biodiversity. But of course, now we see that biodiversity in, in inter, interrelates with all these other sectors, with everything we do on Earth. That's what I was focusing on in my speech. It's not only about the birds and the bees. So it's about the translation that we need to make because the value of nature is the value of everything. And health, of course, is a very, how to say, uh, very closely with biodiversity. Um, when it comes to solutions, because um, it, I don't know if you know, but 75% of, of the medicines in the, UK, in the US in the last 50 years are still found in origin, originally in nature. So there's a huge, huge connection, connection with, with health and biodiversity. We see that, uh, for instance, with COVID, everybody has to go out. That's the only thing we could do. But then we, yeah, we, we, we rediscovered the value of, of nature to health. Eh? in prevention of burnouts and things like that. More and more studies are there. Uh, and that's the good thing. So the relation needs to be, let's say, uh, between biodiversity and health needs to be taken also by biodiversity and conservation uh, organizations and bring that forward to the table. Um, and uh, well, that's basically the story. How can we integrate biodiversity? And it's also what, what uh, was said, by 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 Brazil, eh? we, we it, it it connects with everything. It's such a broad story, and now we start to become aware that we need to tell that story, uh, because for me, because I'm more or less more in in the situation of trying to uh, how to say to uh, 
to lobby for biodiversity, to, to, to try to be the ambassador for, for biodiversity. You see that the storytelling is so important, but based on scientific uh, evidence. And that's so beautiful about, uh, let's say, organisms like uh, IPBES or the Conventional Biological Diversity and all the scientific institutes that they made the story. We can try to translate them and bring them to the political ta table because that's the only yeah, one of the that's the most important thing that we bring that to the governments so that they see the interrelations uh, in that. Thank you. Does um, any anyone else wants to add on that? No. Okay. So I have a question for uh, Dr. Van Havre. Um, could you share a concrete example of what it means to be living in harmony with nature? What does that look like? Does it look the same in every culture in the world? And what is the place of eating meat in such a vision? And what is the position on eliminating meat from our diets of organizations like the EPBS? That's that's a that's a very interesting question. And 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 believe me, one of the 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 challenge that uh, Francis Agual and I have is making that bridge between the different culture and different ways. And 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 you don't know how many times I go back through translation and the language I can understand, I can see how the certain context or meaning behind the world, it translates in a different ways in other, in other language. What we're trying to do is build bridge because those issues are global and, and action that uh, are being taken in, uh, in Brazil as impact on species that migrate to North America, and it is the same around the world. So, so we have this interest and, and this demand and requirement to work across uh, our culture and difference and find language. So um, it, is, it is in fact, at the end of the day, relatively easy to reach out to our colleagues. Um, I, I'm referring some conversation with colleagues from Bolivia about the meeting of Mother Hers and what they mean by that and how we can translate that um, and, and how we can use the experience of others. For example, under IPES, there is some really useful language that, that address that. So that's, uh, that's the way we work across the different language. What does the living in harmony with nature mean? That means that having in place the mechanism for, for making decision that contribute to people's well-being, but at the same time conserve nature for the longer term. So it is not about stopping every economic activities. It is about making sure that when we make a decision, when we make a decision to have a mine that will mine lithium because it's useful to make batteries for electric cars, which is something we need, we put that in the least damaging place possible, and we do that in a way that we can accept. So. Uh, managers and people around the world are making decisions every day at every level. And we're trying to have the system in place that allow them to make those decisions, which take me down to the other part about uh, the change in our diets. There is no doubt that the biggest change that will happen if we're successful is in, in the agri-food system. And, and we've seen that one of the big changes is changing the way the decision we make about food on our table every day. Does that mean stopping uh, meat altogether? I doubt it. I think it's going to be very difficult in many uh, culture to stop uh, meat altogether. Does that mean reducing very much uh, the consumption of meat and turning with different kind of meats that do have certification and have benefits? Probably. So uh, what you, you want is to supply the consumer that is making the choice at the end with alternatives that are viable and durable and with the information and the economic needs, means to be able to make those choices. So this is why this notion of enabling economic development is important because even if I supply a, 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 a sustainable alternative, but that sustainable alternative is out of the reach of those people that have to make those decisions, that is not success. So very, very big change coming up for all of us. What, uh, what was very interesting when, when I heard the first presentation from Ignace is that that notion that we should be describing 
the future we want and convincing people that this future is a better one and well worth the efforts to get to that future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Hilde, the question uh, also mentioned IPBS um, and the role of organizations uh, in eliminating need, perhaps. Yeah, maybe very briefly. Um, it was, I would say, uh, a bit touched on in the global assessment in the sense that the key driver of biodiversity loss is land use change, and that is indeed driven by consumption and production patterns. And so it indeed the assessment points to the need for healthy and plant-based diets, diets, but I think this will come out even more clearly in the assessment that is currently ongoing, which is called the nexus assessment because it looks at the interlinkages between um, biodiversity food water health in the context of um, climate change and i'm pretty sure that uh, the need for yeah, healthy plant-based diets and shifting uh, diets will will come out more clearly in uh, in that specific assessment thank you thank you okay. So then we have another question for uh, Ignaz. Um, so the Flemish government called for application for new national park, of, um, which is a good thing. Will there be a kind of cooperation once they exist and will there be physical corridors to connect them in the future as to promote easy migration for plants and animals? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> uh, just to, to answer that, it's not only in the Flemish uh, region that national parks will be established. Also, the Walloon region uh, recently decided to go for two uh, new national parks, also the first ones in the Walloon region. And of course, uh, we need to uh, interconnect them. And that may be the most important, maybe also issue at, at, the, at the global level, because from my point of view, we jailed uh, nature into protected areas and everything what was outside the protected areas was a kind of free to do and that's what we need to re reinforce now we need to discuss about yeah, the values of nature that starts at your flowering pot in, in, in at your home and, and at your back door because it's there it's not only in the protected areas so yes of course we need to interconnect these national parks as as the hotspots of biodiversity in Flanders and in Walloon part in Belgium as well and everywhere in the world of course and we need to have tried to find new ways of doing so and uh, like Basil said uh, about uh, our the, the, the food we eat in the in the future I think there is a huge which, let's say uh, collaboration possible with the future uh, nourishment of the future farming uh, 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 systems of, in the future because we I think that we lost that connection and we have to restore that so we have to come to that to that sense so yes I hope so and I think so that there is also some work to do on the on the legal side because the, these connections uh, throughout uh, Flanders uh, it, trying to reconnect and, and make corridors for nature and protected area, nature reserves and protected areas are so much needed. It's now into the legal framework, but it needs to go to, to an executive, uh, let's say, management now. And maybe to, as last, maybe, I don't know if you know, but do know that Flanders is a very, let's say, urban uh, region and it's one of the most fragmented regions uh, in Europe, we are after Malta, the most fragmented region in Malta, and 89% of the semi-natural uh, ecosystems are smaller than one hectare. So uh, we are such a small, uh, let's say, stamp. Uh, we have stamps of nature uh, areas, so we need to enlarge them. That's good for the national parks. Uh, and I think uh, if we can do that, uh, we are on the right track. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then we have a, a general question. Um, what can citizens or NGOs, uh, local or national, perhaps also international, um, do to create more awareness and action from our governments? It seems to me that politics as a ho whole worldwide still choose for economy, growth and um, yeah, profit. Uh, which are driving us over the edge in the short run. Uh, what are your advices on this? Maybe if I can start, Myra and others can, can, uh, can add. 
I think citizens and their organizations are extremely important. What, what I see is that governments and negotiators are coming to, to the meetings with mandates. And those mandates really, uh, basically are reflecting what they heard from the electorate. So the stronger the voice, the stronger the message, the more articulated it is, uh, the better it will be. Don't assume that business and the economic sector is necessarily opposing uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, we've developed a very strong relationship with the agri-food industry. Uh, they're very worried about the state of biodiversity because they depend on things to be able to grow in order to make a profit. So uh, they're very worried about uh, quality of soils, uh, lack of uh, genetic diversity, into livestock and, and the risk posed by, gen, by zoonosis, et cetera. What I think as, as group, whether regional or national or international, uh, is to better describe the future you want and better describe the tools and, the, and, and work with the various partner in terms of developing solution and bring them. As individual citizens, you have choice every day in, in what you do and, and um, the, the, the food you buy, the clothes you buy, the activities you choose to take. Um, if you choose to visit a, a protected area or contribute to a restoration efforts, that is noted by government. And, and uh, I think it is very important that uh, you make your voice heard and, and that you bring your argument. I see government are ready to listen to you and they're interested and they will eventually be very careful in terms of the amount of interest there is for, 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 for our issues. Uh, one advantage we have on our side is everybody can relate to nature, be it uh, a flower on the window seal or a garden or protected area, everybody can relate. It's a lot easier than climate change. And, and uh, as a civil servant for many decades, I've been able to, to change the message to targets to different spectrum of the political masters we have. And we were always able to get uh, a resonation with, with any, any type of government. So I encourage you to continue to, to link to people, but that's my part and others may have a better answer as well. Thank you. Yes, maybe I can add a little bit. I think that uh, politicians in the end will always always follow the majority of what people want. And um, the, the difficulty was that there is no majority for this, let's say, sustainable future. But this is changing rapidly now. A lot of people become aware that we are losing our comfort zone. The climate isn't stable anymore and doesn't provide us with rain when it needs to be, needs to, be needs to rain, or it rains too much when, it, when it's not needed. Um, and the other thing that is a positive signal is that not only, let's say, the environmentalists are saying that, now also the people with climate change are saying that, and not only the people with climate change, now we see in the economic sector a very interesting change, whereas they come to senses and think and then become sure that there is no business on a dead planet. If you see what the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, which they make every year a risk report, and the top three of the risks for, for doing business in the future are environmental related. So you see now that the group which is asking for more biodiversity, more sustainability, socially in balance, of course, more, uh, more ecological uh, related uh, food, you see that this group is increasing rapidly. And that's the good thing. The only thing for me, if you ask me, the, the, the biggest question is not, can we find solutions? Because I think we will. The only problem we have is the time. Can we do it in the time of the next decade where we need to halve the, the emissions huh? and we need to stop uh, biodiversity loss? Can we do that in time? Because that's the, uh, the challenge, I think maybe the, the most important challenge that we have uh, nowadays. But I see the group growing rapidly and that's the good thing. Thank you. Okay. So questions keep coming in, so that's nice. Um, 
the signals of biodiversity degradation and need for integration are very clear uh, for many decades now. Um, yeah, so what is stopping governments and decision makers to implement the necessary measures and what can the audience do to help this process? Maybe I can start. Uh, the, the signals are clear, but the response are different. I, I think if, uh, if uh, we are sitting in the developing, in the developed world, and, and uh, we're ready to, to take action. And I think everybody is, would be happy to uh, pay a little bit more to have uh, sustainable food on our table, et cetera. If you are in a developing countries with significant challenge to uh, take decision every day for the survival of people, let alone their development, it's a very different picture. What we, what I would like, and I think it would be helpful, is to put in place mechanism where you can have financial flow from the developed world to the developing one associated with, with uh, environmental services. So even if we're eating a lot less meat, perhaps uh, it is the same amount of money, and, and part of that money is uh, going toward uh, conservation. And, and, and flow back to, uh, to those developing countries. One, and that allow me to, to, to speak about a little bit of a, a concern I have is that there is that notion that developed country will close their border uh, for many importation of food. And, and that could be a, a negative uh, impact. Uh, what we should be looking at is uh, ensuring that the production is done in the most effective way where it's um, the best to do it in around the world, not necessarily within national borders of a single country. So some countries will be uh, okay because they have a good variety of food, et cetera, and they can do more or less what they want, but others, it may be very challenging. So what, what, we, what we need is, is that notion of flowing the resources and ensuring that we we, we allow that socioeconomic development uh, that need to take place in the developing world in a sustainable way, but uh, it would be, it would be uh, very dangerous to have the developed world dictating what, uh, what should be the lifestyle of developing countries. And that's certainly not something we want to do. Thank you. If Hilda doesn't want to come in to no, I, I, what I wanted to say was indeed very similar to what Basil said in terms of, I think there are a lot of societal challenges that we have to tackle. It's not only the biodiversity crisis, it's also food security, water security, climate change. And, and, and the, the complex thing is that indeed there, there are a lot of trade-offs. We can do some good things for climate change, but that can have a negative impact on biodiversity. And so it's indeed trying to, yeah, to, uh, to approach this complex uh, all these complex interactions in a yeah in a in a holistic way and, and trying to create synergies and make the best out of or out of uh, our approaches but um yeah it's it's not an easy it's not an easy uh, not an easy thing to solve just a few lines uh, on top of that it's what we see in in uh, with governments or politicians they often see this as a cost because they need to do a lot of things and say, oh, what? Oh, who is going to pay for this? But we need to translate it into an investment. This is an investment in a better life for the future. Huh? It's not because of climate change. It's not because of biodiversity loss. We have to do it anyhow to invest in a better life. That's what we are. We want to do, have a better life. So we don't have to do it uh, for them. We have to do it not, we have to do it as an investment and not as a cost. It's about translation again. And if you can show politicians because the, the best they know is economics of course huh? uh, so if you can translate biodiversity climate change food security and so on into an economic language not as the one and only language but as an other evidence of how how it can also bring some economical value i think we can make a big step ahead thank you okay um, so we have uh, another question for you, Ignaz, um, because as you mentioned, um, yeah, you mentioned the green helmets for biodiversity. 
So we have a question of Alexander who asks if um, the green yeah. helmets would be fair to a militarization of biodiversity protection. Doesn't this reinforce a racialized image of the uncontrollable poor poaching third worlder? Yeah. Um, and one can shoot, exclude a racialized body who is trespassing our most beautiful wilderness. But this is not the wrong focus. Yeah, that's of course, if you just look at the pictures, you say you should say, oh, this is now the militarization of biodiversity protection. It's, of course, everything but that. It's just figuratively speaking that I did it. So because I think now the world needs organized uh, that we help to protect natural ecosystems. Huh? Uh, you have you have an interesting organization and in, uh, it was originated in the Netherlands. It's called Just Dig It. Huh? Help to go to developing countries to 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 harvest rain, to harvest water, things like that. Because we need to help now the indigenous people with their knowledge to make it work. Uh, it's not let's to say oh now we have a, a, an army for. Uh, that, that does the trick and, and, and the militarization, it's uh, everything except that. So it's completely the different thing. But you know, you have to, to, to bring it as a kind of, uh, I have to say, everybody knows that we invest a lot of money in blue helmets. We know the, the billions of dollars that are invested in it, and it's a good thing if we do the same for biodiversity. And that is just an image that I brought to bring it up to a discussion. And I did it uh, with uh, the UN secretary. Uh, of um, of the UN already uh, this discussion on the online uh, the discussion and he was very in favor for that uh, idea. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. Uh, in the theory of change, biotech was included among the solutions. Uh, could you elaborate on this? What about the risk of biotech leading to further domination of nature rather than working together with nature? Actually, uh, what uh, the, I, I choose some very simple words to summarize the target, and the full language in the in the, in the target is something around uh, protecting and addressing the risk of the and the negative impact of biotechnology. So, um, but nevertheless, I think there is with biotechnology both a potential in terms of uh, increasing yield uh, from production. And, in the, and potential negative impact, which is in that target on tools and solutions. So um, I, we're going to have to find solution for production of food. And, and those production are going to be a balance on the demand side with change in, in choice of, of uh, foods, you know, reducing. We know, all know the, the, the importance of reducing the demand for meat. But also, there will be a need for increasing uh the productivity and we can use all kind of words but it, it it end up how much food we can produce from a a defined number of actors to address the requirement of the increasing world population because that's that's a fact that we're gonna have to face whether biotechnology has a role into that equation we'll have to see and if it's done it has to be done in a, in a safe and sustainable way but definitely, it is not something we cannot we can ignore. Thank you. I would like to add a bit to this question uh, because, well, there is the trend of implementing market solutions and expressing functions of nature as uh, ecosystem services in order to create um, models for nature protection. And uh, I was while well, we were wondering about your views uh, on these developments too. Perhaps um, Hilde or. I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, if it's about monetizing, I mean, in, in terms of kind of um, putting a value on nature and, and, and whether this is positive or negative. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion uh, on that already. Um, and I think it's also very central in the IPES debate because they, uh, in the IPES context, we no longer refer uh, exclusively to ecosystem services, but we call it nature contributions to people to take into account the different values that, uh, that or the ways that people relate with nature. So um, I think there's a progress being made and in that's indeed, it's not all about money when it comes to the values of nature, but there are also a lot of things that you cannot capture in a monetary value and, and that are still very beneficial for human well-being. So yeah, we can only hope that this is also uh, 
being taken into account uh, even in uh, by the by the governments and the only thing i can add of course is that there is of course at the moment a kind of new initiative that uh, tries to open up the GDP values because GDP values are all uh, most uh, most of them are, are uh, uh, just um, capitally uh, or economic uh, uh, related. So now there is an, uh, a group working on the system of integrated environmental and economic accounting, which, which brings in also the ecosystem values into the GDP accounting, which is also so, uh, interesting to bring that uh, into that new mindset together then with the scientifically knowledge brought by people like uh, uh, Kate Raworth and, and uh, Mariana Matsukatu, uh, which brings uh, these planetary boundaries into the economic system, which is interesting, I think also for the biodiversity world to learn about that. Perhaps, uh, Basil, you also wanted to speak? Uh, perhaps you can uh, do the last uh, speaking for tonight. The, 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 it's interesting to see there is definitely a movement that uh, look at uh, nature in national accounts. So basically valuing uh, what you do to, to protect and restore your, your asset. Um, in, separate from that, Ildus talked about what can be done in terms of uh, creating those monetary flows from, from a globally to ensure that there is a value associated with uh, environmental services. So definitely that is taking place, but well beyond that, we're trying within the framework to look at all financial flows. And, and what we're seeing is that the financial sector, the private financial sector has learned their lessons through climate change and is now knocking on our door asking uh, how they can characterize risk related to biodiversity in their system. So they, they don't want to invest into businesses that would be facing uh, large change, negative ones. They want to know about that. That's a, and, and it's like it's up to us to harness that capacity to ensure that the money is flowing in the right direction, not just knocking on the door of the finance minister one more time and trying to extract a little bit more money from them. So we can do so. There is a vast potential out there, and and, and I'm convinced that uh, we we need to pay attention to that uh, in terms of part of the solution. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, um, well, especially Basil, Hilde, and Ignaz. Uh, thank you so much. I think it was a very interesting webinar. Um, thank you also to all the participants for the questions, and uh, we will send out a replay link later so if you want to rewatch or share it and we hope to welcome you all uh, on the next webinars um, in the same series of the green post corona talks so yeah thank you for being here and have a great evening or a great day basil if you want to add still uh... no no thank you very much everybody and thank you for your interest <laughs>